the permanent staff tracers and painters and go through the night. And they got uh, meals on wheels at two in the morning. Sausage and mash, I remember. <laughs> I believe there are a lot of drugs about, but um, I never saw any. <laughs> and, uh, uh, in fact, we, we got raided. I remember one evening when a um, couple of policemen came in with a sniffer dog, and I think they found some aspirin. Now, whatever you do, don't touch that button. Which button? That one. This one. The film came out to immense acclaim, adding to TBC's fame, but not its fortune. Oh, it made our name, yes, yeah. but I wish I'd got 1% or something, just a little tiny bit. We never made money out of it either. We, we ended up totally bankrupt. And in the true spirit of the times, Yellow Submarine proved that if a crowd of creatives work all hours in a confined space, all you do need is love. Lovely love! It took the words right out of my mouth, John. Well, I think we finished up with six illegitimate children and three marriages or something like that. <laughs> Dope Sheet would like to fast forward to the future of animation. We asked members of the public to view some of this year's crop of independent animated films. And where better to watch them than Middle England's favourite retail therapy zone, Blue Water in Kent. Toby the Square Boy by Gary Hawkins. Ouch, Daddy. I'm not your daddy. Ouch! Now go and make a nuisance of yourself somewhere else, Square Boy, before I telephone the police. Basically, it's the boy that uh, belongs to an orphanage and has run away from home, and he gets into all kinds of trouble. <coughs> you, mister, have you got any sweeties I could have? I'm really hungry. My mum and dad fetched me down south to see where Queen lives, but now they're gone. What does this say? Dad? My favourite part was the part when he went into the oven, he had to clean the oven, and it, he was so small that he actually could actually fit into the oven. Finished or bleeding finished? I'll be the bleeding judge of that, let's have a look. Mmm, not bad for a little one. Expelling the Demon by Devlin Crow. That's it, Richard. I'm leaving. Oh, come along, Sport. I only asked to give her a lick, just one little taste. You were getting on so well. It's a kind of psychological um, story about uh, feelings, probably, yeah. Uh, snap out of it, Professor. You're getting boring. Why do you begrudge me a little fun? Where would you be without your spunky little tongue? The eternal fight between, <laughs> between good and bad. Expelling the demon means he spell the demon that is inside you. Seagull, 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 seagull. You have ways of making you talk. <laughs> the tongue represents the demon, and it tries to expel the demon. It just realizes that this demon is speaking too much. He's saying too many things. <laughs> Cheetah by Ian Gardner. The film was about um, a sultan's cheetah, and the sultan wanted the cheetah to have a baby, and all of his animals within his garden had a baby except for the cheetah. I think he made the film because he wanted to show the evolution of animals to their children. Little Dark Bird by Mike Booth.
Okay, you've got the, the plasticine blob with a sick mind. I think it was a, a lot to do with love lust and it was a cross between something like the old fashioned Ludwig before the news and some psychotic nutter late at night. Now it was an interesting five minutes, but it was a cross between uh, some sexual fantasies with a bit of Freddy Krueger thrown in at the end, and I couldn't figure out whether it was a Bollocks Productions or Bollocks. And Diaries in Time of War by Alejandra Jimenez Lopez. I think it's a film that's full of interest, a great variety of um, style in it. Uh, there were some happy family scenes in it. The other thing that I thought was impressive was there were, it was apolitical. There was nothing political in it at all for me. It was just that, that perhaps you might say simple message that the devastation that warfare costs to individual lives is immense. That was, that was a message. Um, pretty moving. Number 18 by Sam Morrison. Surprise! I thought it was quite funny, like um, English stereotype, the way they came sort of rushing in the door and it's uh, too busy to have um, time for people. The mum just gets left standing there, makes the tea, gives them the biscuits, and they all run around and take her for granted. Tea? That she's got her own interesting secret life. Hello? <laughs> Who is this? You disgusting little man. Who was it? What did they say? Hello? Some poor lost so after the break dope sheet flips through underground comics and crosses the border to canada when winsor mckay animated his newspaper cartoon little nemo in 1911 he set a precedent for the transformation of comic strips into animation little did he know what he was starting Since then, a plethora of comic strip creations have combined their day jobs on paper with animated starring roles on the screen. Many of today's most successful series come from humble self-published beginnings. Dope Sheet went underground to see how cult comic creations make the change to animation. Well, here we are. We're all set. It's a capacity crowd and we're ready for the World Championship stare-out final. I'm basically a very, very slow drawer, so I quite like the idea of using the same image. I did a, I did a comic called The House of Hatch where I had um, the main character, Sigmund Spassky, the champion, just like looking out at the viewer. And it was the time I was doing that that I came up with the uh, idea of two players like staring at each other. I think the TV gave it a new depth, actually adding movement, things like the streaker. <laughs> things like the action replay were quite different. Yes, there it is. Yes, yeah, incredible, David. Mm. Spassky's produced an attack from nowhere when we were least expecting it. I think they basically wanted to keep it as near to the comic as possible, which I think they did. It was all about anticipation. Face value, when you look at it, you think, oh, you know, it's very still, nothing moves. Here, yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, look at that! Uzian tried something there, David. Yes, um, but I think Solovka saw it coming all the way. 
Meanwhile, Roberta Gregory's character, Bitchy Bitch, is itching for some movement. I guess you'd call Bitchy Bitch a very realistic cartoon character, which is kind of an oxymoron. She is, like, really female. I mean, you know, she has cramps. I mean, you know, when she gets up in the morning, her body, I mean, you can almost smell her, you know. What kind of an idiot goes shopping this early on a Saturday morning? Oh, look at those lucky mannequins. Everything fits them. Lucky, lucky plastic. I'm just really kind of fascinated by this collaborative process because most of the comics I do, it's all my own work, it's all my own writing, all my own art. So I feel pretty secure with that. Well, you mannequins, I feel great about myself. Really freaking great. And I'd rather enjoy it when people kind of take the character and sort of add their own energy to it. As long as I have my comic book, damn it. So is animating graphic art just filling in the blanks between panels? The idea of animating an existing book like Arkham Asylum or, or one of the others, it's not a terrible idea. Arkham Asylum has a lot of stuff in it that is really not very literal at all. And the way that the book is laid out and the way the images work with each other, it's not just a film in still pictures. So long as there was a realisation that the comic is the comic and there are certain aspects to it that we could adapt to film, but it really has to be thought, rethought and restructured and made a film, made to work as a film, then great, you know, that could work, that could work perfectly well. It's going to be a film that it uses the bag of tools that film comes with and uses it to its full effect. Peter Bagg's alter ego, Buddy Bradley, has had a harder time making it to the small screen. He was pretty much starting from point zero, didn't go to college, was just a low-level drug dealer and was even a failure at that. I never thought that uh, my work would ever be animated. I never thought it was commercial enough or palatable enough for it to be a popular or economically viable television show or movie. And that all changed when uh, The Simpsons came along. We have a winner! And I thought, well, if this could be so popular, I could imagine doing something along the same lines. We made an animatic for uh, MTV. Hey, come on in and check out my spacious new dick. Well, here it is. Four rooms for only 650 bucks a month. They didn't wind up airing it. They had other shows they liked better that they aired. No! And then I just went through the same experience all over again with another cable station, HBO, and uh, and they also decided not to do it. No! Are you telling me my window of opportunity is just slammed shut? Right, so, partner. You know, I still find it eminently doable. It's a simple matter of economics. There's more to it than that. It's the movers, the shakers, the cats with a vision that make the scene what it is. Yeah, oddly enough, the most successful uh, and satisfying bit of animation that I ever was involved in was I was hired to do the character designs for uh, these television commercials. There were these little 15-second TV commercials for Round Table Pizza. Oh, 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 oh. I was very happy with the way they came out. Here's your napkin, sir. It was just a lot of fun, and it's a blast seeing your cartoon characters bounce around on TV. Maybe Mr. Bag's sentiments are a bit too nihilistic for the mainstream. Canadian animation is sometimes accused of being worthy, bland, and overlong. Dope Sheik put this theory to the test by paying a lightning visit to Vancouver, the indie capital of Canadian cartoons. Hello, I'm Marv Newlin. Welcome to Vancouver, Canada, world capital of animation. I'm standing at the location of the invention of world animation. In 1886, one man cleared Vancouver's vast virgin forest with his bare hands. The wood pulp was used to make paper for the world's first cartoons. This man, Al Sims, is the founding father of world animation and the inventor of the legendary spit technique. You have a bottle of ink beside you and you have a pen and you draw a bit, right? 
take a couple of pictures with a camera, and then when you want to advance the character and change, instead of changing drawings or acetate as you normally would do, I'd rub, rub out a bit of the drawing that I did there, and I'd, I'd redraw the character moving a bit on the same sheet of acetate, right? And I'd keep going like this. Well, that became known as a spit technique. Pretty well, if you wanted to know it, anything about this craft, you had to go out and do it. So in 58, I sort of went out and bought a camera, you know, a Bolex, and then from there it just sort of uh, grew, you know, we had, so I got commercial jobs, like, you know, commercials, TV commercials. Sir, do you mind if we engage in a sex act on the sidewalk? And I've always kept on, like I've always tried to make a, a, like almost like one film a year, or, you know, there's nobody out there to scream at me because, geez, you know, they've got a broadcast aid that comes on the air in five minutes, you know, that's gone. Early in the 20th century, animators began to arrive in Vancouver. I arrived disguised as a log at this very spot. Well, you had a choice, didn't you, Marv? Uh, I did. Vancouver or Saigon or something? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's, that's why you came here. With the huge profits from my first film, Bammy Meets Godzilla, I set up International Rocket Ship. Our prodigious output includes the haunting dry noodle. We also produced five of my own films, including Black Hula, a film that explains existence, entertaining as it informs. Lupo the Butcher was considered offensive by some. But Rocket Ship was outschlocked by this film. Quiet, please. It's actually a, an old basic classic cartoon theme where a, a fellow's trying to get some rest. Only he takes it a little bit farther than most uh, in his um, reaction to being disturbed. Shut the fuck up! Did I hear something come out of that pecker holster you call a mouse? I think uh, that little boy humor, it's so above board and it's so well known. <laughs> maybe someday there'll be naughty little girl humor too. That'll be just as annoying. <laughs> and maybe the guys will then feel, I don't get this and this isn't funny to me. In fact, I find this a bit offensive. <laughs> Your name in cellulite started as uh, a woman attempting to change herself into the images that she saw in magazines and on television and in movies. And her body rebels ultimately and explodes out of this prison. And she realizes she actually likes that better. It's wild and it's scary and it really frightens her at first, but you know, at the end of the film, she realizes this is, she, this is a much better way for her to live. Vancouver's bottomless pit of animation talent has come to the attention of U.S. capitalist corporations. Animators who were once free to roam the virgin forest and paddle their kayaks are slaves to the merciless Yankee dollar. Hi, welcome to Bardell. Vancouver's come a long way in the last 11 years. When we set up here, there was basically two other animation studios, uh, one being Alcens and the other one being International Rocket Ship. Now, uh, if you look in the phone book, you'll find that there's probably close to 20 animation-related companies. So we got in at the right time, and uh, we rapidly grew, and then we went on to work on uh, Animaniacs, and uh, we're producing the prequel to the Prince of Egypt for DreamWorks, and uh, it's all being done here in Vancouver. Vancouver's surrounded by thousands of tiny forested little islands. Some animators have escaped the multinationalist tune work of the downtown studios, choosing to go native on Vancouver's archipelago of animation. Well, I guess the films I make are um, animated experimental films, using only just the film material itself. I don't use a camera or um, yeah, an animation stands or anything. So I take the film and draw or paint or 
scratch into the emulsion and um, and and then and make the soundtracks the same way. It's animated sound, which means um, creating the soundtrack on the film frame by frame by creating different shapes. Um, I try and get different tones and, and different sounds from from these shapes as they pass through the little light inside. I like to think of the sound as, as um, music from, like if, if we have pictures as being um, uh, pictures from the mind's eye, kind of, how I work with the, with the visuals on the film sometimes, I try and think of the sound as, as sound from the mind's ear. We'll be screening some of the film shown in tonight's programme after the break in Beyond Dope Sheet. Dope Sheet will be on again this Sunday when we investigate the hidden secrets of German animation. We look at Penelope Pitstop's role as a gender warrior and we uncover the secret of America's unsung genius. But first, here's a film from a Canadian student, Jakob Pistecki. In disbelief he watched the Balkan beat him black. Milos skin to find a moment to untie him from the track. So he slithered and he slunk, so softly and so clever. But nervous and afraid, his knees began to quiver. And when the babka noticed that the goat had been set free, she erupted like Mount Etna as approached her. Milos knew that babka's wrath would prove to be his end, but he took some consolation in the fact he saved his friend. Then in that final moment, out of nowhere, the goat sprang, and he knocked the big mean bobcat inside the clangity clang. And the train just kept on rolling with the bobcat in the back. 